All right, let's get started here. So my name is Brian Geary. I'm the communications director for Pearson College, UWC, and I'm very pleased to be interviewing another alumni of uh, the college. In this case, it's uh, Mr. Eddie Amensa. He's a year 17, 1992, originally from Ghana, and we're actually talking to him from Ghana this morning. So uh, Eddie, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, talk to us this morning. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Well, it's great. I, um, I, I know that for you, this must be a very, very busy time. Uh, you've just taken on a, a fairly recently a new position at the Right to Dream Academy in, in Ghana. So um, have you begun your tenure there yet? If so, how long have you been there? Um, yeah, so I had the luxury of um, not having to be in the, in the seat fully uh, in September and October when I came. Um, so I had a couple months of a, of a relaxed, kind of observe the place and watch while my predecessor was transitioning out. Uh, but beginning in January, I am fully in the driver's seat. So yes, it's uh, I feel like I'm drinking from a water hose. I, 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 I mean, use all kinds of weird metaphors. I'm, you know, building the plane as I drive it. Um, I am drinking from the water hose. I am, yeah. <laughs> And metaphors are a perfect way to to, uh, to actually illustrate what what is happening. Yeah, right. I, I know exactly what you mean. Does the school year in Ghana begin in January? Is it a calendar year? Uh, no. So the school year is similar to to North America. It begins in September, um, goes you know the first term ends in uh, December, uh, and then second term, which we're in now, is January till Easter, and we get a long Easter break, about a month, and then we go again from May June to July. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so it's a shorter summer because we have a longer version of spring break. I see. Yeah. Well, tell us, first of all, a little bit more about the Right to Dream Academy. I mean, I hadn't heard of it before, but when I started reading about it, it there, I had some associations with it and I associated it with Denmark, but I believe the Academy has uh, originated in Ghana, has been exported increasingly around the world. So. Share share with the people who are watching a little bit more information about that. Thank you. And I'm not just saying this because I'm here, because this is really an amazing institution. Um, started with, you know, a, a British uh, visionary, I call him Tom, um, seeing a few boys on a dusty pitch in Accra, Ghana, and thinking, wow, what talent. And wouldn't it be great if they had the opportunity? And so Tom... Uh, to, if you can see behind me, the first group of players were actually in that picture, oh, right yeah. behind Tom. Um, and so 1999 is when it started. Um, and over the few years, it's over 20 years, it's grown considerably uh, into what it is today, where um, the, and I love the word exports, right? So this, this program that started here uh, has been exported uh, to Europe. So... Um, the technicalities, right to dream involves soccer, as we call it in North America, football, as we call it here, uh, school, and a very strong character and purpose uh, program. And so those are the three legs of the stool here. Um, and then most of our students would transition into professional football in Europe or into student athletes in North America. Um, over time, the program grew enough that um, the group, the investor group, acquired a team in Denmark, FCN, uh, which provided a very direct pathway for our top players. Um, and it still, it still does that right now, where our top players who are good enough to play in the top leagues in Europe have a good landing ground mm -hmm. um, in Denmark um, for, for our team in FCN. Uh, so in fact, the, the, the stadium at, in, at FCN is called the Right to Dream Park. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I think I think it's quite incredible for our players to kind of walk through that. And so this collaboration has been really fascinating to have European um, athletes with our uh, West African athletes uh, work well together. Um, FCN is well known for being one of the teams that has the youngest. Um, oh, that's the school bell you're hearing. Um, the youngest uh, team to participate in the top league in Europe. Um, and also has the highest number of um, African um, young players. Um, and that's because of the, the collaboration. Um, it's been fascinating to see this year 
Um, it just happened to coincide with my arrival uh, that we've got a new uh, investor. Uh, so a new partnership has been formed with the Mansour family, it's an Egyptian family business. Um, so this export product uh, is going to see uh, new horizons. There'll be a new academy built in Egypt by the end of 2021. Um, and then eventually there'll be one um, in England as well. And, and, it, and it really is incredible, the story that originated in, in, uh, in Ghana and has grown to include Denmark and soon Egypt as well. And I've been reading as well about the men's who are family and their, their commitment to this kind of initiative. Um, before we go too far down sort of the rabbit hole of, of football though, you mentioned character development, you mentioned academic strengths and that. So tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, a number of, of individuals, students who have gone to your school have also achieved athletic-based scholarships in the United States. And this is also a route, I guess, to success for many. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you're staying away from football because that could really prolong this conversation. That's where my interest is most is. Uh, you know, I've been an educator since, since university. Uh, and so one of the things that attracted me about Right to Dream, the, the football, obviously, but the fact that the education program was such an important part um, of, the, of the enterprise and then the character and purpose piece. Because um, I think that's, you know, I wrote a piece a long time ago about the, the false no, uh, nomenclature about soft skills, right? So those kinds of things that we believe are important, the values of integrity, of, of service, of leadership, um, of collaboration. These are things that in most um, enterprises and business circles are described as soft skills. Mm -hmm. And we consider them not just soft, um, we, we consider them essential. One, because they're not easy to learn, they're very teachable, but not easy to learn, uh, but not easy to practice. Um, but we also think they're so essential um, to have the, the emotional intelligence to be able to develop yourself in terms of your character and understand your purpose um, in, in your existence. I, we think it has a huge impact on how you develop as a football player or as a student. Um, so the character and education program here is very, very strong. Um, I think it's played a huge role if you talk to our graduates and our alumni in helping them transition into challenging environments. Some of our students have gone to some of the top, top um, independent schools in North America. Mm -hmm. and, and if you talk to them, and I've talked to a few, it wasn't just the academic preparation that helped them to succeed. It was the understanding of resilience. It was the understanding of integrity. It was the understanding of how to build trust. It was the understanding of how to have that sort of grit that will carry you through. And that leg of the three of the three-legged stool, I think, was probably the most significant for them. Um, and that's one of the things we're most proud of that our students are distinctive for that, for, mm -hmm. for being uh, students of who are purpose-led, have strong character. And of course, they're amazing football players. <laughs> a bonus. Uh, two things that you said there, resilience and grit. I mean, they, I'm not going to conflate the manifesto of Right to Dream with the UWC values, but there certainly are some similarities in terms of character building, in terms of, of building young people who, can, who are adaptable and who look beyond the end of the street, for example, and understand that there is... Um, a future out there, not only for themselves, but for the world and the people that they're working with. Right, and I, and again, I, I don't mean this in a, in a small way, but two years at Pearson, in my mind, are two of the most significant years of my life. Um, and I've told people that arriving at Right to Dream is a culmination of all my experiences. It's almost as if I've been preparing for this <laughs> since I was three years old. Right. So if you look at my my early life, football was my focus. And my mother was like, all right, so you got to shift and pay attention to your education. So then she did that in such a way that got me to a really good boarding school in Ghana where I got selected to go to Pearson College. 
I get to Pearson College and that third leg there, the resilience, the grit, the, the social intelligence, the emotional intelligence. In those two years, I felt like I got a crash course um, in, in that, not just in the program that Pearson um, you know, administers, but in the environment, in the people that I met. Um, so you, you can see my, my life trajectory, right? Football, education, Pearson character. And then I go to university, I come out of that, become an educator. Um, and, the, and the resonance between the values here, right to dream and UWC, it's, it's amazing. In fact, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, who would be great candidates for UWC? Right to dream graduates. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. So don't be surprised in a few years if you hear a right to dream student to be in you know, some UWC around the world. And we'll make sure that people remember that they heard it here first. That's right. <laughs> Broke the news by. That's right. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring you back to Pearson a little bit later, but now I'm gonna go back to talk about football for a second. So you talked about your own, your own youth and you started out uh, as a footballer and, and certainly even someone who's a pedant when it comes to football, international football, like me, under, under, remembers the performance of the Black Stars of Ghana in various World Cups and in African Nations Cups as well. So it, it seems like success on the football field particularly for the nation of Ghana, is also manifested in other areas like academics and, uh, and character as well. Completely. So um, the best carrot we have for attracting players and students to come here is, uh, is our football, right? Um, and so, and it's the biggest sport in Ghana. Um, and we have some of our legendary um, sons of Ghana working at Right to Green. Um, so Michael Essien, who you've probably heard of, uh, was a huge star for us, uh, is one of our coaches in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Here in Ghana, we have another um, player who played in the African Cups and was captain of the national team a couple of times. He's one of the, the coaches of our senior team here. Um, we've had those two World Cups that Ghana uh, really shone in, had a couple of two or three Right to Dream graduates in that group. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very, very proud of that. Uh, but I think... Um, again, that level of success in football really um, has been a, a good launching pad for us to say, see, it's not just that you can come to Ride to Dream and possibly play for the Black Stars. You can also get a really good education. Um, and then you also build a really good character to become, you know, a real um, leader within your community. Uh, so those, those things have been very connected for us. Um, so our goal is, you know, to continue to produce players that future heavily on the Black Stars, um, but also to produce student athletes that become lawyers and doctors and accountants um, and can, you know, can make a huge impact on their community. You, you talked a little bit about, um, about your own career as well. And um, it, it, I, I think for a lot of people who are going to be watching this, uh, number one, the fact that that this academy, the Constitutes Academy, has been exported from Ghana from a small, relatively small West African nation, basically around the world. And your personal story too, after Pearson, I believe you spent most, if not all of your career in the US and you were attracted back to Ghana for this, for this opportunity. Um, interesting, interesting path. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so you know when we're at Pearson, um, they would ask, so um, are you going back to your home country when you're done here, right? And, and those of us who had come from more economically challenging backgrounds, uh, are you, we used to bristle at that, right? Because, you know, if you're from a, a well-to-do country or well-to-do family, you, we considered it a luxury that you could just go back. Um, and some of us had a little bit more of a... Um, of another incentive to stay a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't because we didn't care about um, growth and development in our home countries. It was actually the exact opposite. It was that we cared so much that we didn't want to just go back without enough of a skill, without enough um, collected wisdom, without enough collected experience to make a real difference. Uh, and so some of us stayed a little longer than we wanted to. 
um, honestly speaking. Um, and I put myself into that category. Uh, but, you know, my, my family lives in Ghana. I grew up in Ghana. And I've always wanted to find a way to um, give back sounds so pejorative. But, yes, to, to, to make a huge uh, contribution. Um, so, you know, my personal journey and Right to Dream's journey, I think, has some major parallels in it. Um, and then when, it was, when the opportunity came along that I could actually, after all these years, I have, an ex I have experience as a good educator. Um, I love football, still try to play, even though I'm old and slow. <laughs> and, I doubt uh, it. <laughs> and I have, you know, I really begin to understand uh, the value of having resilience and grit and all those things that fall into that box. Um, that I could come and be part of what some folks are terming the, the brain game, right? So in the past, um, African countries and other countries like uh, within that box have described a brain drain of really talented folks leaving uh, for financial or other reasons uh, to emigrate to, to um, higher income countries. Um, and now you've seen a little bit of a reverse of a brain game, and I, I, want, I wanted to be part of that. Um, and of course, all these times that we've been away, we miss home, right? We come home, you know, every two years or so, you come home every summer and you get reminded um, of, of your roots. Um, and so the fact that I could um, take this opportunity to come and just plant my feet a little bit, enjoy the weather, have some good food. My mother lives an hour and a half away. Um, all of those factors came together very nicely for me. So I, I count myself very fortunate because um, I know there are folks that I've always thought about finding ways to become more part of the, the movement here. Well, it's a wonderful arc of a life and a career to be able to have that opportunity. Now, do you, do you have your own family Did uh, that, that moved with you? Oh, oh, you're venturing to, yes, I do. So uh, my wife and daughter are still in the US. Mm -hmm. And so we're navigating uh, the whole process. Well, we agreed on that outcome first. And so I came last September. Uh, they're gonna come here uh, during spring break. Uh, and then hopefully this summer, um, both of them would join me. Uh, my daughter will be going into ninth grade, um, which is she's 13. Um, so it's that age where nothing I say means anything to her. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and then, you know, navigating a big transatlantic move during a pandemic uh, has been very fascinating. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a close unit and I, I'm looking forward to having them with me. I, uh, you, you, you must be. That is... Um... I, I know I've talked to many people who've moved in the past 12 months during a pandemic, not, not the least of which is my boss, the head of Pearson College, who uh, moved from Singapore back to, back to Pearson. And the navigation of those challenges are, are full-time job. So I'm sure, I'm sure it is the same thing for you and your family, but I'm, I'm very glad to hear that you're going to be able to get, uh, get together again soon. Um, and I promised you now we'd go back to Pearson and talk a little bit about that, about your experience at Pearson. Um, how did you originally learn about UWC and, and subsequently Pearson when you were growing up? Yeah, so I went to a, a boarding school here about two hours up the road from here. Mm -hmm. And our headmaster, because uh, the way UWC, Ghana's National Committee works, is that they send the information to a bunch of schools and ask for nominations. So our uh, headmaster, um, understanding what the requirements are, what the expectations were, um, chose me um, and had my mother come and, and share the information and said, if you're interested, you should apply. Um, and so that's how, that's how I first heard about UWC. So I went through the selection process. Uh, I was very excited because Pearson turned out to be, you know, like I said, the most significant two years of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I often ask alumni that I talk to, and was there anyone at Pearson during those two years who, who made an, sort of an outsized impact on you, that had an impact on your life? And, and it could have been a teacher, it could have been a maintenance person, it could have been a driver. Oh, Brian, that's an unfair question. Yeah, I know it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, asking you, I'm asking you to name names, yeah. 
but that's okay. I will put you on the spot. And then I will leave out some people and get and get in trouble. Um, no worries. You know, because of visa issues, um, I got to Pearson about a month late. Um, school, school had already started, and um, and I'd come from a school in Ghana where you know you addressed everybody with their titles, Mister, Doctor. Um, and I don't think, maybe they had warned me, but I don't remember being prepared for the fact that everyone was going to go by their first name. Um, so um, big, tall guy that I'd seen in the brochure comes up to me and says, my name is Tony. <laughs> Tony, wait, you mean Tony McCown, the, the big boss, the, the person in charge is coming to the dining hall to sit with me? that just got here two days ago to check up on me and see if I'm okay. Um, that, that surprised me. That was one of the first leadership lessons that I learned um, about the, the importance of relationships. So, and that was within the first week. So that had a huge impact on me uh, when, when Tony did that, uh, just to come and sit with me um, and chat with me and just ask me how I was doing. Um, so I, I, I remember that. Uh, but in terms of people that had an impact on me, I'd say the Africans, right? I'd grown up in Ghana and there was something, there was an irony about the fact that I'd never been out of Ghana. I never met any other Africans until I had to go to North America to meet my neighbors, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and they had a huge impact on me. Um, and a lot of them I'm still close to today. Um, but then the... You know the, the entire place, right? I mean, I'm in a room with somebody from Norway and Greenland and Canada and, and Fiji, and and just you know being being immersed in that environment, that bubble as we called it, uh, was really incredible. So since you forced me to name somebody, I'll say Tony <laughs> uh, but really, there's a the lot. The list is very long. Of course, it that. is. Yeah, yeah, understood. I, I kind of enjoy watching people squirm, you know, to try and get out of answering that question too closely. But you know, I still ask it anyway. Tony, by the way, is still very much connected with the college. I mean, I worked, I've worked with him over the years as uh, he was chair of the board, and he still takes a great deal of interest in in our students. So that's that's a nice sort of chronology to to remind people of. I want to switch gears for a second. I want to take advantage of your, your I, I, I guess your experience of being, being a young African man who came to North America, who spent a, a good deal of his career in the United States. And I want to ask you this because in the past year, putting aside the whole pandemic, there have been not unexpectedly, given the George Floyd situation, given the, the situation that happened uh, in so many places across America, there's been a lot of conversations about race. There's been many conversations about social justice. There have been many students who have been coming to us in the administration saying, we're not satisfied. We're not satisfied with the diversity of the leadership at the college. We're not satisfied with the diversity um, that you talk about in, in your student body and in your leadership. And also con uh, congru congruent with that, there's been a tremendous consciousness raising about um, ind indigeneity and our place on the land. We're actually on the campus itself is situated on the unceded territory of the Chiano First Nation, which adjoins the community adjoins our campus. And to, to be honest, it's been a bit of a challenge in terms of, of leadership to adapt and understand and, and understand what they need to do about that. So once again, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, what kind of advice, what advice would you offer as someone who worked in the U.S., who obviously saw a number of things up, up close um, in terms of social justice, in terms of disparity? What would you say to an institu educational institution leadership, such as the people at Pearson, about how, how we navigate um, where we have to go in terms of diversity and in terms of understanding um, our place on indigenous land? Wow. Well, first, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'
<laughs> the presser, my, right? Yeah, forgive my long preamble for that. Um, no problem, no problem. I want to applaud the, the students of color who are um, leading this charge um, because I think they are the result of many long years of, of some level of resistance or some level of Christ for, for social justice. I think you even mentioned that as a black student union, Yes. Um, currently at, at, at Pearson. And I laugh to myself to say, there was there've always been a black student union. It just wasn't codified. <laughs> Precisely. It was, it was always there. Uh, but I'm glad now that it's official and, and codified. So when I think about the issues of race um, and diversity and inclusion in general, um, at institutions, I think of it in two categories. Um, one is the um, overt and covert incidents and systems of injustice, right? So the microaggressions that students might experience, the, the indigenous communities feeling unacknowledged um, in their contributions, um, the, the real overt racism that you might see uh, among students, really insensitive mm -hmm. comments, actions, acts. Um, and those are things that I encourage any institution to examine from, from um, an institutional standpoint of how we address them um, proactively, not just reactively. Have systems in place to address things that come up reactively, but proactively um, educate folks on um, on how you want to be, how you want us, how you want all of us to live together as an institution. Uh, and part of how you achieve that is exactly what the students are asking for, is diversifying your leadership so that when you're having these conversations that involve decision making, voices are represented. Uh, and, so that, and that connects to my second point, is the other side of the coin is what I call center, right? Which voice in terms of race is being centered in any conversation or enterprise. Um, and that, that's the one that sometimes institutions forget about, right? So you hear that, well, there's no racism here. Nobody's been called a name. Nobody's been mistreated. And so we're fine. Uh, but then what you have is paradigms in which one particular race is centered um, in conversations and systems and in, mm -hmm. in practices um, and everybody else um, arrives as a guest, right? People of color, indigenous people uh, participate in the processes as guests and never feel centered. Uh, whether it's in the literature that you read in school, whether it's in the folks that are, are making decisions uh, or leading, uh, where you always feel um, that your, your folks uh, or people like you, your skin folk, um, are never centered. Um, and and that, that's a, a thing that can minimize your, 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 your self-worth um, if you're not paying attention or if you don't have a full bucket uh, before you come to the table. It can really minimize your self-worth if an institution is really not thinking about how to center um, all races, gender, um, or any other levels of... of um, of diversity. Uh, and so any school, any enterprise, any institution that wants to, um, to do better, as my wife says, <laughs> to do better, um, has to pay attention to, to both arms. One is what are we doing uh, systematically to, to pay attention to incidents of event, um, overt and covert racism, sexism, but also how are we centering um, the, the conversation, who, who's in the center, right? If, so we're, if we're talking about whatever it is, uh, is our goal to make sure that the, the majority of white folks are comfortable or are we really trying to make sure that everybody has a voice and is fully centered, right? You know, I, I feel bad about, you know, the, the lack of diversity at our school. Wouldn't it be great if we did something about that? Well, that's great. Um, but what is that going to do in the bigger ecosystem um, for, for all of our students? And so I think the, the bigger goal when students are demanding more diversity in leadership or more diversity on campus is that then you have the voice that can represent, you know, um, 
the change that you're looking for, right? It's, it's very hard for 10 white men to be able to sit around a table and make a decision that's going to affect, you know, a group of black, white, Asian, uh, <laughs> right? Group of folks. So you have a higher chance of achieving a much more um, cohesive unit if that decision-making table has more diversity, right? So the goal itself is not to have diversity at the table, is for diversity at the table to be able to um, engender a higher chance of social justice, if that makes sense. It does, it, it does completely. And, and you know, not, not to say that Pearson is, um, is failing, but uh, I, I think Pearson as an institution is, is embarking on some paths which I'll say this at risk of my own, my own job. <laughs> Sometimes in the past, you know, you think that because you have a relatively diverse student population, you have an understanding of all of the issues, of all of the issues of mm -hmm. diversity, inclusion, social justice. Um, but finally, the scales seem to be coming off of our eyes. Um, and with students creating, bubbling up, codifying, a, a, as you say, a black student union, um, holding events, you know, on a regular basis and inviting not only students of color, but also all students and adults on campus to, to various events. Institutionally, I mean, we, we have embarked on a uh, reconciliation action plan to, to understand what reconciliation for us as an institution means. And it, it means reaching out more to indigenous communities and inviting them into quote unquote our space and understanding that our space really isn't our space, it was stolen a couple of centuries ago. So it's coming from bubbling up from the top and coming down from the bottom and also giving us a degree of understanding. And, and in many cases, I think, you know, discomfort because we, we don't understand. And UWC brags about having, you know, we're, we're good with having uncomfortable conversations. Well, we're human. We like to have comfortable conversations. So uncomfortable situation or conversations about, about race, about justice, about history. We're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about leaning into the discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not always easy. Um, and I would say that um, diversity is not the goal. That diversity shouldn't be the goal. Diversity, in my mind, is the path, the tool to get to equity and justice. And, and I think, you know, at least the, the younger UWC that I was in probably assumed that once you got to diversity, you'd be fine and everything would be okay. I, I, Eddie, you're very gracious in taking this question and answering it. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I know that our, our time is growing short and I wanna, want to let you get back to, to your day. Um, uh, the one, one thing I meant to ask, so when you came to Pearson, were you absolutely shocked and appalled at the soccer field, the football field? <laughs> Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, and yes. And we still, we still managed to get some good games in. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, and we still have the goal. I haven't been there lately, so hopefully it's better now. Uh, I'll, I'll say yes, but, um, you know, when you come here for a reunion, if you, if you do, then uh, don't be surprised if it still looks the same to you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I appreciate it. Uh, Eddie, is there anything else you wanted to add or you, you wanted to conclude with? Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. Uh, you know, and I know I'm not the only alumni uh, who's interested in supporting the kind of work that Pearson is doing um, because I, I want to be, and when I plant my feet a little bit more, I'll find ways to become more involved uh, with the college. But I want to be able to participate in this process that you're talking about uh, to get to more equity and justice for, for all students because Pearson and the UWC movement in particular is, is such a gem and could be such an instrument for, for, for change um, in our society. And, you know, I could list a bunch of criticisms about Pearson, but at the exact same time, my time there um, has made me who I am today you know, mm -hmm. and the folks that I have around me. So, you know, why not be able to participate in helping make it even so for, for, the, for the, the future generations. So uh, I always feel guilty when I've, I've not been involved as much. So when your email came, I was like, oh, finally, this will help 
assuage my guilt about not being involved in this at all. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Brian, for your time. And um, I'm looking forward to being more involved. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to talk to you. I, I hope that uh, as time passes, we can create future opportunities for you to become involved. I hope that uh, we see some uh, right to dream people over, over at our campus sometime soon as well. That'd be so, great. Yeah, the very best of All luck right. uh, with, your, with your new position and um, look forward to hearing more about uh, the future stars who are coming out of the academy. All right, thank you. Thanks very much, Eddie.